Are you gearing up for radiology board exams? The Radiology Review wants to save you money. Visit our discount code section for current offers on Radiology Review recommended educational resources. Head to theradiologyreview.com and navigate to the discount code section. Terms and conditions apply. Limited time offer. Discounts may vary. Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. For additional content, please follow the Radiology Review on social media, such as X or Instagram at RadRev Podcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website, theradiologyreview.com. Welcome back to the Radiology Review Podcast. On this episode, I will discuss gastrointestinal fluoroscopy with barium. This continues my theme of fluoroscopy of the gastrointestinal tract, where the last two episodes I focused on fluoroscopy of the esophagus, and on this episode we will focus more on the bowel. A free downloadable study guide on this topic will be available for download at theradiologyreview.com if you want to review in writing what we discuss in this episode today. I created these episodes based on listener feedback, and if you have episode content requests, please email me at theradiologyreview at gmail.com, and I will do my best to get an episode out on the topic you suggest, prioritizing those where I have multiple requests on a specific topic. And without further ado, let's get into the questions and answers for this episode. First question. How can abdominal ascites manifest on abdominal fluoroscopy? With ascites in the abdomen, the small bowel loops can appear diffusely separated when ascites is present. This can be a somewhat subtle sign, but if you see on a board exam question widely separated bowel loops in the abdomen on a barium small bowel follow-through study, one consideration is ascites. Next question. On a small bowel fluoroscopy follow-through study, what are differential considerations if diffuse, thick folds are seen within the small bowel? When you see thickened folds within the small bowel diffusely, think of etiologies that cause edema in the bowel in a diffuse manner, such as cirrhosis, hypoalbuminemia, and various causes of bowel venous congestion. Next, on a small bowel barium fluoroscopy follow-through study, what are differential considerations for non-diffuse focal thick folds within the small bowel? On the last question, I talked about diffuse thickened folds throughout the small bowel and said you need to think of diffuse processes such as cirrhosis, hypoalbuminemia, and various causes of venous congestion. And if you see focal thick folds within the small bowel in a non-diffuse manner, you should think of etiologies that can result in more focal bowel edema, such as bowel within a radiation field that has post-radiation edema, bowel reacting to adjacent inflammation, such as bowel adjacent to an inflamed gallbladder or pancreas in the setting of pancreatitis, or a bowel that is edematous due to ischemia related to local low flow state from a territorial vascular insult. Next, if thick folds and bowel nodularity are seen on small bowel fluoroscopy, What are leading differential considerations? Three leading causes I would remember on board exams for seeing thick folds as well as bowel nodularity are first, bowel malignancy, for which melanoma and lymphoma are classic, but other malignancies could also present similarly. Note also that lymphoma and other lymphatic processes such as lymphangiectasia and lymphoid hyperplasia, can also appear similarly. Like pulmonary nodules, nodules of varying sizes are more concerning for metastatic disease, whereas uniform small nodules are more likely to be benign and related to something benign like lymphoid hyperplasia. 
The second of the three causes of bowel nodularity and thick and folds that I would remember is Crohn's disease. And the third is infection, for which bacterial infection by Trophorema whipplei, I may have pronounced that wrong, sorry, but that is Whipple's disease, W-H-I-P-P-L-E, Whipple's disease, can be classic. Next question. What if a gastrointestinal fluoroscopy with barium shows dilated bowel with thin folds? If on a GI study with fluoroscopy you see dilated bowel with thin folds, I would first think of celiac sprue. That would be classic here, as well as scleroderma involvement of the bowel. Beyond those, think of ileus and obstruction in the appropriate clinical setting. If fluoroscopy initially shows evidence of celiac sprue and later shows thickened folds with nodularity, this could be a manifestation of onset of small bowel lymphoma, for which uncontrolled celiac sprue is a risk factor. For scleroderma of the small bowel, remember the classic so-called hide bound appearance, H-I-D-E-B-O-U-N-D, hide bound appearance, due to decreased separation of the valvulae conniventes due to muscular hypertrophy in the bowel wall. And I would go ahead and look up an image of this classic hidebound appearance with scleroderma if you do not know what that looks like. Next question. A ribbon-like small bowel with thickened folds in an organ transplant patient is classic for what entity? The answer I'm looking for here is graft versus host disease. As bowel wall edema progresses, bowel wall folds eventually can become effaced, causing a featureless bowel appearance in the setting of graft versus host disease. And that featureless bowel is sometimes also termed a ribbon-like small bowel. More chronic disease can cause stricturing in the bowel as well as the upper esophagus. Next question. What are the two contrast agents used for double contrast barium enema? In a double contrast barium enema, the two contrast agents most used are first and obviously barium, a positive contrast agent that is combined with insufflation of the colon with carbon dioxide gas, which provides negative contrast as well as distending the bowel lumen. This double contrast technique can provide very high mucosal detail. By contrast, pun intended, a single contrast study on fluoroscopy most typically would use barium alone. Next, on barium fluoroscopy, what are classic features of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis? Crohn's disease can have a classic cobblestone appearance on a barium fluoroscopy study, as well as fistula, thickened folds from bowel wall edema, and a classic string sign due to chronic stricturing and or acute spasms of the bowel. On the other hand, ulcerative colitis most classically shows the lead pipe sign in chronic cases wherein the bowel becomes featureless, shortened, and narrowed. Prior to development of a featureless bowel, or if there is mixed acute and areas of more chronic inflammation in the bowel, mucosal ulcers and a granular appearance of the colonic mucosal surface can also be seen. Remember that ulcerative colitis also has a strong colon cancer risk, so polyps or strictures can be a sign of coexisting colon malignancy. Next, true or false? A diagnosis of pancreatitis can be suspected based on barium small bowel follow-through. The answer here is true. Although pancreatitis probably can't be confirmed based on barium small bowel fluoroscopy, and the same is also true for cholecystitis, but inflammation of bowel loops via fold thickening on fluoroscopy can be seen if the bowel is secondarily inflamed due to adjacent pancreatitis or cholecystitis, 
So these entities are in the differential for fold thickening of the duodenum if seen surrounding the expected location of the pancreas or gallbladder. Next, what is Menetrie disease? That is M-E-N-E-T-R-I-E-R. And how can this classically appear on fluoroscopy? Menetrie disease is a form of hypertrophic gastritis that is idiopathic and classically occurs in young children or middle-aged adults, more commonly in males. Hallmark features of this disease include a triad of hypoproteinemia, achlorhydria, and gastric edema. The systemic low-protein state from the hypoproteinemia can cause ascites and pleural effusions, as well as excess mucus production in the stomach and bowel. On upper GI barium fluoroscopy, expect classic features of enlarged gastric folds, most pronounced along the greater curvature of the stomach, with sparing or lesser involvement of the gastric antrum, as well as barium dilution in the stomach due to the mucus hypersecretion and high volume of fluid in the stomach. That is another case where it may be helpful to look up some images so that you know what this can look like. Next, what are the two classic types of gastric volvulus, and how do you differentiate these? The two classic types of gastric volvulus are mesenteroaxial and organoaxial. These are fairly high yield to understand for board exams, so I would encourage you to spend some time on this concept so that you are prepared to answer these questions. With mesenteroaxial gastric volvulus, the stomach twists over the mesentery as the name mesenteroaxial suggests. If you draw a line that bisects the stomach and passes between the gastroesophageal junction and the duodenum, that would approximate the axis of twisting in mesenteroaxial volvulus. Organoaxial volvulus involves the stomach twisting where the greater curvature of the stomach rotates over the lesser curvature. Therefore, it is twisting over an organ rather than the mesentery, as the name organoaxial would suggest. If you draw a line passing through the stomach and it courses nearly through the greatest length of the stomach without passing between the gastroesophageal junction or the duodenum, this approximates the axis of organoaxial volvulus rotation. Organoaxial volvulus is more common following blunt trauma or with something like a paraesophageal hernia than is mesenteroaxial volvulus. Next question. Which is more common between mesenteroaxial or organoaxial gastric volvulus? The answer here is that it depends, and this is somewhat of a trick question. In adults, organoaxial volvulus is more common than mesenteroaxial volvulus, accounting for about two-thirds of cases of gastric volvulus. However, in children, mesenteroaxial volvulus is more common than organoaxial volvulus present in just under two-thirds of cases. So if a question stem is showing an adult, organoaxial volvulus would be more common, and if it is showing a child, mesenteroaxial volvulus would be more common in the pediatric setting. Next, which type of gastric volvulus is most likely to cause gastric obstruction and strangulation? Fortunately, the less common mesenteroaxial volvulus is the type of gastric volvulus most likely to cause obstruction and strangulation. However, organoaxial volvulus can also obstruct and strangulate if rotation over 180 degrees along the axis occurs. If rotation is under 180 degrees, organoaxial volvulus may be entirely asymptomatic. Symptoms of either type of volvulus include acute onset of gastric pain, intractable retching without the ability to vomit, and inability to pass a nasogastric tube. Next question, 
What are key upper GI barium ferroscopy findings of gastric volvulus? Potential ferroscopy findings for gastric volvulus include gastric distension in the left upper quadrant with extension into the thorax, gastric inversion or twisting, obstruction with partial or absent passage of contrast beyond the stomach, possible beak sign, B-E-A-K, beak sign at the point of twisting and obstruction. I would definitely be prepared on both CT or fluoroscopy or perhaps MRI on a board exam to identify the different types of gastric volvulus, and I encourage you to spend some time on this concept before you take your board exams. Next, what are key findings of Zollinger-Ellison syndrome on an upper gastrointestinal barium study? First, remember that the clinical scenario of Zollinger-Ellison syndrome is presence of a gastronoma causing elevated gastrin levels and can be part of multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1 when gastronomas are functional to secrete gastrin. The gastronoma itself may be identified on cross-sectional and or molecular imaging studies but may be secondarily seen as a filling defect in the duodenum or elsewhere in the bowel on an upper GI fluoroscopy study. Gastronomas are more commonly located in the duodenum and are less commonly located in the pancreas and can often be multiple. Peptic ulcer disease, gastrointestinal reflux disease, diarrhea, and gastritis can result from gastric acid hypersecretion that results from the gastronomas. Therefore, associated findings on an upper GI barium study include rugal fold thickening, gastric nodularity, erosions, and ulcer formation in the stomach and or bowel, with the duodenal bulb being the most common site, but ulcers can also occur elsewhere in atypical locations such as the jejunum. If you see multiple duodenal ulcers on a board exam, consider highly Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. This can also cause dilution of barium in the stomach due to fluid hypersecretion within the stomach. And to recap on two entities we've now discussed, with Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, you have gastric hypersecretion due to gastric acid hypersecretion, so you would have elevated acid levels, which could promote ulcer formation. On the other hand, with Menetrier disease, you have barium dilution in the stomach from gastric fluid hypersecretion, which results from a low protein state, causing low acid levels, also termed achlorhydria. I want to conclude this episode and our review of fluoroscopy, at least for now, with a quick discussion and a few questions on fluoroscopy and radiation dose, which I also find to be very high yield on board exams. So, given that fluoroscopy exposes patients and providers alike to radiation via x-rays, Questions on radiation dose from fluoroscopy should be anticipated on radiology board exams. How does fluoroscopy dose change, meaning increase or decrease, as a function of the following factors? First, increase in patient size, meaning increased thickness of the body part being imaged. Will dose increase or decrease? With increase in patient size, the dose would be anticipated to increase. Next, what about a decrease in beam energy? Would this cause an increase or a decrease in dose? With a decrease in beam energy, the radiation absorbed dose would increase. Note that a decrease in beam energy can be achieved by lowering the KVP, or reducing the amount of filtration because filtration is generally designed to filter out the lower energy x-rays that increase absorption without meaningfully increasing imaging quality. Next, what about a decrease in field size? Would that increase or decrease the dose to the patient?
with a decrease in field size is, is probably logical dose decreases because less area is exposed to radiation. Next, what if you increase the magnification? Will this increase or decrease the dose to the patient? With an increase in magnification on fluoroscopy, remember that this will also increase the dose to the patient. Next, what about an increase in the grid ratio? Increasing the grid ratio on fluoroscopy will serve to increase the dose to the patient. Next question. What happens to radiation dose as the distance between the patient and the x-ray source increases? As the distance between the patient and x-ray source increases, the radiation absorbed dose will decrease because you will have an increasing number of x-rays that will diverge away from the body and therefore not be absorbed. Next. What will happen as the distance between the patient and image intensifier increases? As the distance between the patient and the image intensifier increases, the dose will increase according to the inverse square law. And last and final question for this episode. True or false? To lower radiation dose to the operator, meaning you or one of your colleagues, should you stand on the same side or opposite side of the x-ray tube during a fluoroscopy study? The answer is that to lower radiation dose to the operator, the operator should stand on the opposite side of the x-ray tube to avoid scatter from the x-ray tube that increases operator radiation dose. So if you want to stand further away from those scattered x-rays, stand on the opposite side of the x-ray tube. That concludes my questions and answers for this episode. I hope this has been helpful for many of you. Go ahead and review some of this content in writing by downloading the study guide at theradiologyreview.com. And I hope your study and board preparation is going well. And keep up the good work and study hard. Remember, you have to study really hard to succeed on radiology board exams. So prepare to succeed. I will catch you on the next episode. Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment. The Radiology Review is pleased to offer the Board Exam Study Guide, Episodes 1 through 101. Available for purchase as a book on Amazon or in Kindle version.